Everybody say amen. amen. We are grateful to God. Uh, despite what is going on around us, God is still good. And there is not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. Uh, this corona didn't catch him by surprise. Uh, he he He's all-knowing, so he wasn't surprised at all. And so we, 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 we were caught off guard, but not our Lord, because there's not a friend like him. Is that all right? Aren't you glad you serve a God like him this morning? Uh, this virus has all of us thinking about things that are really, really important. Things that we have taken for granted for so, for so long. A lack of unity, the closeness of family. You can't get rid of folk even if you wanted to now. Uh, but there's a good thing about that. The good thing about hanging out with the kids, uh, teaching them some things you might not be teaching them if we weren't together, uh, some things with our entire family, our spouses, family time together. Yes, it, there may be some negatives there because the enemy is going to always do that. But when we look for those good things that can come from family being together, even in this time of crisis, when we want to get information about the weather, we turn to the weather service. When we want to get information about the world now, well, we need to turn to the one who made the world. Uh, the one who knows the world, the one who spoke the world into existence, the one who with a span of his hand created all of what we know as our solar system today. Uh, we need to make that kind of consultation Folk are confirmed with the CDC and the president and the, the leaders, the governors. But when we really need to know something, we need to confer to God who knows all things. In the book of Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says that heaven rules earth. It says the same thing in verse 26, that heaven is controlling earth. So when we want to get some information, hello somebody, uh, let us go to the one who knows all things. Preparing for something bigger. Preparing for something bigger. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We come now asking a hedge of protection around us as we sit in this place. Protection from all type of violence that could be directed toward us and all types of illness. Keep us healthy, keep us safe, keep us strong. Bless us, Lord, as we bless you in this service. We have come to render a service unto you this is a day that the world celebrates Palm Sunday when our Lord rode in on the back of a donkey to declare himself Hosanna, Hosanna, King of all kings. We're thankful for this day. 
it is your day and we acknowledge your day by serving you right now in this place and may our service to you be pleasing acceptable in your sight as we give all of us to all of you we pray and thank you for who you are besides you there is none other we're grateful and we are thankful more than we've ever been. The things we've often taken for granted, we do not now. And maybe that's a lesson for us to learn even in these times. We thank you, Lord, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. John chapter 11. One of the first chapters that I had a chance to really look at when I was attending uh, graduate school at Abilene Christian University. I was studying to be a public speaker, a motivational speaker, an educator, knowing that I would stand before people, but was not intending to be in the pulpit. That was, I wasn't intending that. Y'all hear me? I said, I wasn't intending that. But uh, God has other plans sometimes. And uh, this chapter comes to light, and I reflected back on it this, uh, the last couple of weeks uh, as I was thinking of this time that we're living in. It was one of the chapters that I uh, was encouraged by my professor to, to look at, and I'll get into that later in the message. Uh, but John chapter 11 speaks to us today uh, that will give us some encouragement as to what we are experiencing in some respect or another. Preparing us for something better. Chapter 11 of Gospel of John, dealing with a crisis, a life crisis, a crisis that involves a man named Lazarus. Lazarus lived with his two sisters. Martha and Mary. And um, they experience a crisis. Their brother Lazarus becomes very sick. Martha and Mary sends word to Jesus about their brother. They are experiencing a life crisis. Life crisis is when there's something going on around you and you can do nothing about it. It's, it's a tough ordeal. And you don't have the resources to deal with it. Jesus is right down the street. And Martha and Mary sends for him. Verse 3 of chapter 11. Verse 2. Uh, it was that Mary who announced, anointed the Lord with fragrance, oil, and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother was sick. 
Jesus was real close to Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. When he came through this portion of town, he would stop at their house. They, they, were, they, were, they were close. They were real close. Uh, let me give you a real quick example of that that we'll find if you'll turn back to Luke chapter 10. Just to kind of give you some of that background. Luke 10 and verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman, woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. We're talking about Jesus. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Jesus had come to spend some time with them, and Martha decides to make his favorite meal, probably some black-eyed peas and cornbread. <laughs> Best meal you could ever have. <laughs> But Mary wants to sit at Jesus' feet, and Martha is full of frustration because she won't help her, and Jesus goes on to tell her, just leave Mary alone. She's doing what she needs to do at this time. I share that with you to show you that th this was not their first encounter. Okay, they were close. This was something that was common. Okay, it's like you, you know, we, we, you know, when we used to have folk come over to the house, we'd have some food ready, ready, you know, go get you a plate, all right, kind of thing. This is kind of where we're at now. So they were close, okay? So Martha and Mary sends word, we're back to John 11, that, G, that Lazarus is sick. Verse 3, therefore the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and, and loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. Jesus loved her. Apparently, Spiritual people do get sick. Contrary to what you would hear as a televangelist, that God doesn't want his people sick. Spiritual people do get sick, y'all. And the scriptures bear this out. So Martha and Mary sins for Jesus to come. When Jesus heard that in verse 4, he said, This sickness is not unto death, uh, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Sometimes God allows things to happen that may not always be in what we would consider our best interests, but he's preparing us for something better. Okay? His glory and honor trumps any and everything we could ever think of or ask for. Okay? We were made to glorify him, by the way. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10.31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Isaiah said it this way in chapter 43, verse 7, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Our mindset is whatever we do, say, or think brings glory and honor to God. 
whatever that is, regardless to what people say today or any other time, what comes out of our mouth ought to be glory to God. Because he's preparing us for something better. You history people will remember a man named William Churchill. And he said a profound thing one time. He says, no crisis should ever go to waste. No crisis should ever go to waste. There is something to be learned from every crisis that occurs in the life of people. And if you waste it, you waste an opportunity to learn something that's critical to your life. And as we go through various trials, James says, the trying of your faith does what? Worketh patience, endurance. Because life without crisis wouldn't be life at all. Because there's always something going on. If it wasn't Corona, it'd be something else. It would be. Well, maybe not to this degree, to this extent, but we don't know what it would be. Because H1N1 has killed more people than Corona. Now, that wasn't publicized, and we didn't shut down the world like we're doing now, but H1N1 killed 60 million people. So, there's always something, okay? Just so happens this time, we're on lockdown. We weren't on lockdown before. Just understand, people, this is not to minimize what's going on, but for us to have the perspective that God would want us to have, that we're being prepared for something better. Have you read the Bible more this time of your life than you've ever read it? Well, you should be anyway. You can only watch so much Netflix. Come on, people. Bible ought to be open now, not just on your cocktail table. The show folk, not for show now, is it? You opening that bad boy now, aren't you? You looking for some kind of answer. Prepared us for something better. All right. Verse number six. So when he had heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Wait a minute. Jesus, Lazarus sick. The sisters want you to come and do something, but you're going to wait. You're going to wait. Remember he said in verse 4 that this is going to be done to the glory of God. So Jesus is not surprised here, people. But when we read that, a, you just down the street. He was only two miles away. It's like walking from here up to uh, 105th. Why is it going to take you two days to get that far? Come on, Jesus. Why are you waiting? Lazarus is sick. Come and get to him and, and, and do something for him. But he waits two more days. See, when you pray, there's three answers. If I got it right, you kind, Brother Mark. There's yes, there's no, and there's wait. Okay? If God hadn't made it clear that it's no, or made it clear that it's yes, then it's wait time. So what do we do in the wait time? We keep praying till we get the answer. Why are we waiting? It's not a time to draw away from God. It's a time to draw near unto him. If you draw nigh unto him, he will draw nigh unto you. Amen? You're two miles away, 
and you're going to wait two more days. Well, Jesus has got to deal with his disciples too because they're still trying to figure this thing out. Okay? Uh, so he tells the disciples, well, uh, in verse 11, these things he said after he had said to them, speaking of the disciples, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. The term sleep refers to Christians or godly people. You know the tremendous passage that we find in the Thessalonian letter uh, that we often read through and through services. First uh, Thessalonians 4 13 but I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen what? Asleep lest you sorrow as others who do and have no hope Okay, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So he tells the disciples, Lazarus is sleeping. Okay, but they still not figuring it out. So uh, there's going to be a lesson uh, for them as well. Look at verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes, speaking of the disciples, that I was not there, that you might believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. In other words, there's going to be a lesson in here for y'all disciples to get. Okay? I'm glad that this has come up because there's something y'all need to learn. Okay? Could it be that there's something for us to learn now? Could it be? There are some lessons for us to learn right now, okay? Now, Jesus says that we're going to go to him uh, that you might learn a lesson that you need to know. We get to verse 21. Now, Martha said, to Jesus once he has arrived, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary had the same question, indicating they had had some conversation. Her, her question is the same thing. We'll go over later, but I'll read it now. Verse 32, Mary came when Jesus was and saw him, fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Okay. You were close, Jesus, a couple of miles away, but it took you two days to get here. Anybody here ever felt that Jesus took his time when you asked him for something? That he took his time. Lord, if you had answered the prayer when I prayed it, we'd have been all right. What took you so long? Maybe it took some days for you to get your answer. Maybe it was longer. But Martha and Mary are saying, if you had been here, my brother would still be alive. What took you so long? You was right down the street. It didn't take you no two days. You could have been here in a couple of hours. And I'm going to turn this way because I don't want to look at anybody. Has anybody ever felt that? Jesus has disappointed you and he didn't come when you needed him to.
The disciples felt the same way. Remember, they were in the boat? And see, in Galilee, remember that? Mark chapter 4 and verse 37 says a storm came and it filled the boat. So we got water in the boat. The, the boat is doing the nay nay and the stanky leg all over the Sea of Galilee. Shaking and rock. Jesus was doing what? Sleep. With a pillow. Chilling while the boat is all over the place. And then the disciples came and woke him and said, Care is not that we perish? Boat being crazy and you sleeping? Seriously? Really, God? Verse 39, Jesus stood up, rebuked the wind and the waves. Peace be still. Then the disciples learned the lesson. See, you always got to teach them cats something because they're always missing the boat. And we are like that too. We miss so many lessons that God has for us to learn. And he's got to teach us some stuff. Disciples were exceedingly fearful and said to one another, who can this be? Now you've been waiting all this time and you still got a question. We've been serving God all this time and we still want a question. What is going on around here? And all these years you've been serving God and as soon as your faith gets tested, you want to ask questions. Act like you don't know who God is. God is still great. He's awesome. We serve a great God. And I dare you to ask him questions. You don't have to understand it. That's God's business. But there's a lesson for us to learn. And we don't want to waste the crisis. Not getting the lesson. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now they're kind of figuring some of this stuff out. So, we get down to the further conversation between Martha and Verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. See, Martha's emotional and rightfully so. Her brother died. In her mind, it could have been prevented. Okay. And Martha now checks her own emotions. Because she's frustrated and she upset. If you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know. But I know. But I know. Okay. That whatever you ask of the Father, he's going to do. Now, here's the deal that you don't want to miss. Martha doesn't allow her emotions to get in the way of the doctrine. Y'all missed it. He, she doesn't let her emotions get in the way of her theology and doctrine. Okay? If, if, see, this is why you got to know doctrine. This is why you got to know the text. Because you need to go there sometime. She said, I know what I believe. Now, I'm, I'm emotional here. I know what I'm feeling. But I know more about what I believe. I know that God will do what you ask him to. I'm not going to let my emotion get in the way of what my belief is. And that's what's wrong with many of us today. We've allowed our emotions to get in the way and drown out what we know is right with God. See... Jesus then 
does something phenomenal. Jesus says in verse 23, your brother will rise again. Now Martha knows Bible and she says, I know he will rise up in the resurrection in the last day. I know eschatology. I know the doctrine of end times. I know my Bible. I know that at some point all of us are going to get a glorified body. Jesus, I understand that. But Jesus moves from doctrine now to relationship. He said, yeah, your, your brother will get a new body. But know this, I'm the resurrection. And I'm the life. Okay? He that believes in me, though he may be dead, shall live. See, you're saying the right thing, Martha, but now I want you to really connect to me. See, and that's where we're losing out in this thing, y'all, because our connection with God is lacking because our emotions take over and it, and it trumps and drowns out what we know is true. So Jesus says, I'm the resurrection, okay, and the life. Connect with me. I know you know Bible, but now I want you to experience it. Okay? Right? There are two kinds of people. People who know the Bible. Quote book, chapter, and verse. But don't have an experience with God. Then there are folk who will tell you everything about what the Lord has done for them. They ain't got all the emotion, don't have no Bible, don't know no Bible, but to tell you what the Lord done told them, all right, to tell you what pastors say, all of that, they have no Bible, but plenty of experience. We have plenty of Bible, but no experience. We have scripture. We know the text, but many of us Refuse to have a relationship. That's the issue. But see, you need both. See, you, you need to be able to know the text. Then you got to be able to see Jesus in the text. And you can't see Jesus in the text if you don't have a connection with him. From the word. In other words, the written word must come in connection with the living word. See, you got to have both of them. One without the other makes you lacking. Okay? So, so, so Jesus lets her know your word that you know, your doctrine is great, but now we need a relationship. I am the resurrection. And the life. It's all great to have great knowledge, but let us have a great experience with the God we serve. If you'll turn back a couple of pages, Jesus told the Pharisees in John chapter 5. The Pharisees prided themselves on knowing the scriptures. They, they come up with a, with a text in a minute. John 5 and 39. Jesus says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. What he's saying to them, in other words, you know Bible, but you don't know who I am. Okay? You know the text, but you don't really know me. Okay? You think that all you have to do is just know what the text says 
and not experience what the text says? You think that's what it takes? It takes an experience with God. It takes a connection with him. How do we get that? We get that through our daily communion with God, our daily devotions. We, 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 he becomes a part of our life every day. All right. Now it's Mary's turn. Mary's turn, Jesus has dealt with Martha, and now he's got to deal with Mary. But see, Mary don't want to talk to Jesus. Because Mary all disappointed. Mary mad and upset. She don't want to talk. You ever felt that way? Where life has jacked you up so much, you don't even want to pray. You don't want to talk to God. I, that was before all of you became so spiritual. I'm talking about the times when you was really struggling and, and, and you, you, you were trying to, to get this thing done and what wound up happening, and here's what happens. When stuff hits us hard, okay, we draw away from God as opposed to drawing near. Okay? That's what happens to folk. Folk stop praying. They stop doing the things that they would normally do. Okay, let me give you a Bible. In the book of Peter, James, and Hebrews, we have Christians scattered all over the place, running for their lives. Okay? Folk were dying. Folk were being killed for professing Christ. They were dying. This was their own version of Corona. We're coming to kill you if you acknowledge that Christ is king. Okay? So what did people do? In James chapter 4, two, chapter 4 verse 2, James says, you, you have not because you ask not. What does that mean? They stopped praying. That means they stopped praying. That means they didn't pray. They, all this stuff had them jacked up so much they didn't even want to pray no more. So you don't have nothing because you stopped asking. And then when you decide to pray, you ask for the wrong motives. Okay? Now, let me give you one other one. Since we're at James, let's do Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Okay? And, and, and many folk don't always respond like you do when there is a crisis. They, they just fall away. They just give up. They stop trying. They stop living their life. And in verse number 38, Hebrews 10, 38, now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, what does draw back mean? It means they're moving away. They're, they're not moving to God. They're moving away from him. Okay? My soul has no pleasure in him. Crisis will make some folk just say forget it. Okay? You don't have to raise your hand, but, but, but crisis will do that to some people. Okay? And we who are spiritual should do what? Restore such a one. Okay? When you see that that is happening, you need to get busy about helping them through that. Okay? Because we don't always respond the same way. So, Mary doesn't want to talk. Uh, Mary, Jesus out here, I ain't trying to talk to him. I don't want to talk. How do we know? Let's look at the text. Verse 28. <clears throat> uh, Florida, <clears throat> Florida, I'm going to need you in a minute. So get ready because I'm, I'm flaming. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. 
What does that mean? That means Mary don't want to be bothered. So Martha goes and look, look, hey, Mary, I, look, look, Jesus out here. Come on. Come on. Come on. I know. I, 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 I understand. Come on, Mary. Come on, talk to Jesus. Because he came for you. He want to talk to you. Okay? Verse 29. As soon as she heard that, as soon as who? Mary heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Sometimes you got to go help folk. Okay? Because sometimes people, they going to shut down. Sometimes people just don't want to be bothered. And you know that they need the word. So then you have to go get them. Come on, girl. Get up out the house. Get on up and drink, put some clothes on. Take them rollers out your house and look like you're going somewhere. Clean up. Get yourself together. Am I talking to somebody? Just clean up now. Come on. And her sister went and got her, got her right. Amen. Now Jesus had not yet come into, uh, where, what do I want? I want verse, uh, I got 29. And so let's drop down to verse 32. So I can hurry and get you out of here. Then when Mary came where Jesus was, she finally listened to her sister. Because sometimes all you need is somebody to just come on, girl, let's go. And saw him. She fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died. Okay. She, she hurt. Okay. She hurt. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, because everybody crying now. Okay. He groaned his spirit and was troubled. But I love verse 35. The, the, the first verse we learned when we was eating our food, uh, Jesus wept. I, I love that, see? Because when we cry, he cries too. He understands what we are going through. He sympathizes with us. He came to be like us so that he could understand us. Hebrews 4 is our text. Okay? And I just want you to know that when you're in pain, Jesus is in pain too. When you're crying, Jesus is crying too. He's weeping along with you. He wept. Hebrews 4, 14. Floyd, can you get that? Because I've <clears throat> got a couple minutes left. 4, 14 through 16. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Go. <clears throat> yes, sir. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. That's right. But he was with all points tempted as we are. Yes, sir. Yes, without sin. Mm -hmm. Let us therefore come forward and draw grace. Yes, sir. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Amen. We have a Savior Amen. that knows all about our troubles. He will guide till the day is done. There is not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Okay. Let me finish this up for now. We'll do the rest of this tonight. If you're not going to come back tonight, uh, please, when Merv puts up tonight's sermon, please um, take time to Finish because this ends with a tremendous, tremendous set of encouragement. So please make sure you get uh, the lesson for tonight. But let's do one more verse and let's uh, 
get you out of here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> verse 38. And Jesus, again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus says, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, uh, by this time uh, there is a stench, for he had been dead for four days. Rigor mortis has set in. If I have time, I would tell you about how I got, um, real, real, real quick, uh, one of my classes I had to uh, go to the funeral home to interview and spend a day uh, with the mort mortician, because um, that was one of the assignments. And the professor said, one day you might need this whether you're going to be a preacher or not. I know you don't want to be a preacher, Willie, but you might need to know this one day. Uh, and, and, and you might need to help families that need to know how this process works. So make an appointment. I want you to write a paper about your experience. Now, I didn't want to be hanging around no funeral home all day, but I went. And I learned that rigor mortis sets in in four days. Sales collapse and release a green substance, which is accompanied by odor. So Martha's given Jesus a, a, a lesson in mortuary science. Okay. Uh, and Jesus has a lesson for her. And I mention that because Maurice, Marquise, Rodney, Sam, guys, might be worth your while one day to go because you might have to minister to a family that needs to know what happens with uh, autopsies and really what happens to a body because sometimes families want to know. Floyd, might be a good idea to just find out because you never know. I just mention that as an aside, okay? Jesus says to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Faith must be preceded by sight. If you have to see it, then you're not exercising faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. You've got the wrong order if you need to see it. Jesus says, move the stone. Uh, the time has come for us to exercise our faith in God. Amen. Faith isn't a feeling, it's an action. Uh, we need to know that faith requires action. What's the action in this text? Martha, move the stone. God is calling us to move the stone. Get it out the way, whatever that might be. Some folk are suffering from the virus of sin. The virus of rebelling against God. The virus of ignoring God. See, there's a bunch of viruses out there that's killing us spiritually. Okay, all right? And all we pay attention to is to what's happening to us physically. But there's a lot of things that's killing us spiritually because our faith isn't where it ought to be. So God says, move the stone out the way. And when you move it, you will see the glory of God. Move the stones of fear and realize that we have power, love, and a sound mind. And we understand these things. God has a blessing for us. We'll finish this tonight. I've had you long enough. You've been so gracious. Thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this time. May your word minister to us. And may it bless our hearts. May we know better today 
about your power glory and honor than we knew when we came in and may we exercise what we know is true in our lives and in our conversations keep us in your care bless our hearts we're thankful for what your word means to us in Jesus name amen Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you're not a Christian today, 